There. There you go. Welcome everyone and good morning. Good morning. Happy winter. <laughs> it hasn't been winter and now it is all of a sudden that I wanted to go away. Well, we're waiting for it to get happy. <laughs> Man, I hope it goes back to the 40s. So today we're talking about the Spanish. Spanish Inquisition. You kind of have to be five years old to really appreciate mm -hmm. snow. <laughs> yeah, you do. You're two years old, but even yeah, yes, yes. not even two years old. One kind of likes it and then doesn't like it all of a sudden. Um, so Spanish Inquisition, which really began in 14. 78. There's so many jokes with the Spanish Inquisition from Mel Brooks to um, Monty Python and many things in between, but I'm going to try and avoid those jokes because it's a very serious thing. However, it, 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 it's kind of overblown in the modern imagination. There were not just droves and droves of people being executed and hacked to pieces in the streets by you know, creepy cardinals wearing hoods or gigantic capes. It was actually compared to most medieval practices. Uh, the Inquisition was actually tended to be more fair and more uh, and less brutal. So people were you. Most of the people who were accused in the Spanish Inquisition of being a, a crypto Jew or something were given um, um, like penitential sentences. So they had to go home and go on a pilgrimage somewhere or say a certain number of prayers or give alms to the poor or do a combination of all those things rather than like get their arms removed or something like that. Although <laughs> stuff like that also did happen with the more extreme cases. But anyways, let's uh, open with a word of prayer here and then we'll take a look at the handout for today <clears throat> for the Spanish Inquisition. Heavenly Father, Thank you for the law and justice of our time, and also for the religious toleration, that we are not at the, uh, at the whim of the, of the ruler and his religion, whoever he may be, but that, uh, that as Lutherans and as confessional Lutherans, we are free to practice our faith. And uh, we pray that as a, a new presidency is about to begin, that that toleration would, would still exist, especially for those groups who are, who are conservative and confessional and traditional and orthodox. And uh, we pray that uh, you would give us strength and courage to always stand up for our beliefs and to stand up for those who are weakest in society, um, <clears throat> particularly the unborn uh, and those with, those with learning disabilities and, and physical disabilities and intellectual disabilities and also the aged. And uh, open our eyes now to your holy word and to this period of church history. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 All right, Spanish Inquisition. There is that very, wow, depressing, very dreary little uh, watercolor by Goya. Goya is a famous Spanish <laughs> illustrator, 1746 to 1828. I think it's the Art Institute of Chicago that has a bunch of his paintings of nightmares, little tiny watercolors of nightmares, and they're very, very interesting. He painted just a ton of, painted a ton of stuff. But Goya uh, uh, illustrated a scene from the Inquisition called Zapata in Chains, showing the philosopher and physician Diego Mateo Zapata, there are his dates, awaiting trial at the hands of the Inquisitors. He was later tortured along with his colleague Juan Munoz y Peralta for Judaizing. So there's an example. Uh, uh, two mathematicians, philosophers, physicians, Zapata and Peralta, you know, they were held in prison unjustly and they were tortured uh, for Judea Judaizing. And whether they were guilty or not, I mean, it's up to their, up, up to the inquisitors to decide that. Uh, I'm not sure how guilty they actually were, but also if they were guilty of Judaizing, I mean, we would say that that's not a, a crime that the church should uh, condemn anyone yeah. for. And Judaizing was exactly what? Okay, good question. Judaizing would be, well, think about Judaizing in the New Testament. It would be 
uh, continuing with Jewish practices despite the fact that you call yourself a Christian or that you've been forcibly converted or forcibly baptized. Um, so Judaizing practices would include hallowing the Sabbath day, the Saturday, uh, decorating for various Jewish festivals like Passover and Purim and um, uh, what's another one? Hanukkah. Um, praying in a certain Jewish way, uh, continuing to read Hebrew or having possession of Hebrew scriptures or Hebrew books rather than Christian ones, owning other books that are banned, um, abstaining from certain types of food, maybe f not fasting while the Christians are fasting. That was seen as Judaizing. So if you were eating meat during Lent and eating meat on Fridays during Lent, that immediately made you suspect. Um, and then that, yeah. Um, so let's start in scriptures as we always do. Uh, a few passages again, not quoted by the in inquisitors to my knowledge, not kind of, these were not battleground verses during these centuries, but they kind of give us a perspective on, on the whole thing. So let's start in Deuteronomy 17 verses 2 through 5. If any of the towns of the Lord your God gives you, there is found among you any man or woman who is evil enough before the Lord your God to break his covenant, who goes and serves other gods and worships them, the sun, the moon, or many stars in the sky, which I have forbidden, and you are told of it, inquire thoroughly, and if it proves to be true that such a disgusting thing was done in Israel, then take that man or woman who did this wicked thing out of your gates and stoned that man or woman to death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little severe. It's not like that person was hurting anybody, right? Or, or even teaching the false religion. He, he or she was just worshiping um, a false god, maybe in, maybe in private, maybe in public, but either way, it seems like a very personal thing. And to our very modern ears, that sounds so uh, barbaric and backward doesn't it but this this is you know god talking <laughs> right it's not just some random israelite judge or or some corrupt pope um it's god talking and i mean obviously we we could talk about why this is that um god for his people wanted a pure and, and holy people that only worship him and also basically from even before the covenant was established at sinai the, the Israelites were already disobeying this and worshiping any god that came along, from Baal to El to, um, to Asherah to uh, Dagon, all the gods of the nations around them. So, I mean, unless every single Israelite was stoned, you know, the Israelites would end up having to say, all right, on three, aim for my head, I'll aim for yours, you know? Boom. Oh. Because yeah. they were all worshiping false gods, right? They were all worshiping the gods of the Canaanites, so... I, they would have ceased to exist if they would have perfectly carried this out, but because they didn't carry this out, maybe that's why so many people felt free to worship other gods. But Alan, do you have a comment? It's kind of interesting when, you know, uh, they were told, you know, not to worship these gods, and they all made this vow before God and let this stone be our witness and all those yeah. things. And then they uh, search out this country and say, hey, who is the God you serve? Man, you guys really got it good here. We'd like to know who that is. <laughs> right. I know. I know. Even, yeah, even to the, and then the worship of Yahweh got mingled with the worship of these false gods so that Yahweh become, became a part of the pantheon mm -hmm. of gods. I, I, I get a biblical archaeology magazine, and archaeologists found maybe 10 years ago this tablet where they think it's Yahweh's face. They think that the some Israelite craftsman depicted Yahweh, the one true God who's invisible, pure spirit, but depicted him in order to like put him in the in a temple to another Canaanite deity and then worship yes. Yahweh as if he were another Canaanite deity and was a part of the part of the pantheon of gods. And then you see like from an early time you see the Israelites, you know, they would sacrifice in Bethel and Shechem before the temple was established and the cultus was regulated in Jerusalem. But then that only lasts for a generation for Solomon's reign because then all of a sudden there's a another temple in Bethel and then a temple up in uh, in Dan established by Jeroboam right so Yahweh the true worship of Yahweh is always getting messed up but here you know God through Moses clearly establishes if 
you Israelites should find anyone who's worshiping these false deities and are members of these false groups. You shall take them outside of the gate and deal very harshly with them, right? This is the way to root out false belief. This is the way to, to just annihilate uh, idol worship, to, to annihilate the person who's the cause of it. So harsh, obviously, but a reality from Deuteronomy. All right, let's go to the New Testament now. Whew, okay. 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13. It isn't our job to judge outsiders, but it is certainly our job to judge and deal strongly with those who are members of the church and who are sinning in these ways. That alone is the judge of those on the outside. But you yourselves must deal with this man and put him out of your church. So, yeah, I mean, that this is a well-known passage in Paul's letter to the Corinthians where he basically... You know, he's building on what Jesus says, judge not, lest ye too shall be judged, although he's saying uh, it, it is our job to judge ourselves, basically, as Christians. We judge, um, well, you judge yourself, first of all. You remove the, the plank from your own eye before the speck of sawdust. But, it, but you do care about the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye. So if your brother is teaching something false or believes something false, uh, it is for you to try and help him or her... Uh, return to the truth or to return to God's word. That's what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about Christians judging other people from other religions or outside of the church. He's not talking about Christians judging uh, judging non-believers, outsiders, whatever. He's talking about us judging and kind of policing, policing our own, just as you would police your own family. If your aunt was an alcoholic, you'd probably better say something, right? And help her. Uh, if you're brother is falling into some addiction, you would reach out to his wife and approach him. I mean, that's what Paul is talking about. This is in-house. In-house judging is necessary, right? After we've removed the plank from our own eye, because when we, when we point one finger, we have three pointing back at us, right? I mean, it's the same. It's that kind of thing. Um, it's that kind of thing. Um, and then, obviously, we do it within the spirit of love and not with the spirit of one-upmanship or anything like that. But Paul clearly says uh, it's the job for those inside the church to judge those inside the church. God judges those outside, and then he quotes the Old Testament, purge the evil person from among you. Purge the evil person from among you. So if one of you wa was teaching that, I don't know, teaching that God was not triune and you were convinced or something, I, we'd probably say, why are you still a Lutheran? You know, why don't you go to a different church? And then if you're like, no, I want to stay here to teach Emmanuel's people the truth about, uh, you know, the, the truth about my false, dot, my Aryan teaching or whatever, that, that God is not triune, that Jesus is a creature, then finally we'd have to say, okay, we're, we're going to excommunicate you. You know? Um, so, yeah. I mean, that's pretty, pretty obvious, I guess. Uh, and then 1 Timothy 1, verse 20 among them are Hymenius and Alexander, who might have handed over to Satan to be taught, not to blaspheme. So, uh, yeah, Ooh. ouch, right? <laughs> well known, again, passage that when Paul is writing this letter to Pastor Timothy, it's the first of the pastoral epistles, and he's, uh, he's, he's entrusting a charge to Timothy. But then he says that there are, some, there, there are some who have rejected the faith, who have made a shipwreck of the faith. Two of them, Hymenaeus and Alexander, and Paul has rejected them. He's handed them over to Satan. Now, what does that mean exactly? It means probably that Paul, Paul has basically excommunicated them or left them, allowed them to go their own way My because they're already in he, Satan's he grasp. He removed them from the fellowship of the church. And it was because he believed that the resurrection had already occurred and was teaching that. That's what it says in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> the notes are always are, are always true. No, I, so that goes back to I think a, an old tradition that Alexander was teaching that the, the the Alexandrians were like a Gnostic group that might be named after Alexander, and they were teaching that the resurrection already happened. Um, but there's nowhere in the New Testament that connects Alexander to the later Gnostic sect, the Alexandrians. So 
They don't tell you that in the note, but they just tell you something. Okay, but the point is that Paul hands these two men over to Satan because they're heretics, blasphemers, false, false teachers. So there's an example in the Old and New Testament of, of dealing with uh, idolatry or dealing with false belief or dealing with heresy, uh, usually in a physical way. You know, Paul physically left them or allowed them to go their own way. Um, we physically remove people from the church. We excommunicate them. Maybe physically is not the right word, but we, it's not just a spiritual thing. Like, you know, uh, we, we remove them from our presence, from our fellowship. Um, and this ties into the Inquisition because the Inquisitors uh, pretty much figured they were doing the same thing and that, the, that their brutal methods or even imprisonment or torture um, um, and execution were all, were all ways to cleanse the church and save the church from, from Satan, essentially. I know in our church down here in Norfolk, right, <clears throat> several times that I was asked to help with communion, the pastor would tell me, he said, no, when so-and-so come by me, he comes up here, please don't commune them. Hmm. Because he knew they were doing something that was wrong, and so he just skipped over them. And that had to be a, you didn't want to do it in a way that showed the congregation that, of course, the people next to them would know, but um, it was to help them realize that they were doing something wrong that was hurting them spiritually and that, you know, we didn't want them to participate in an unworthy manner in the Lord's Supper. Right, wow. Yeah, that's kind of, that's referred to as the minor ban. So excommunication would be the next step, removing someone from the fellowship, but the minor ban is is preventing them from participating in the sacraments until they've confessed their sin and repented. Now the Inquisition would, would say, you know, not only do you not commune this man, but hand him over to you know the Fairmont cops, and then they're gonna hold him in their prison and then bring him to our basilica, and then all of the pastors of Fairmont are going to make up a tribunal and bring forth witnesses. And this is going to last several days, and then in the meantime, he'll be staying in the Fairmont prison until we get to the bottom of this. And then it turns out that, oh, this person, you know, it was his, it was his angry wife that was lying, telling lies about his Judaizing tendencies, and so let's actually reinstate him. And the three days that he had in prison are going to be three days off his time in purgatory because we were wrong. So they would even do that. They would even, you know release him from other sins of his past because he unjustly suffered in prison when it was proven that he was innocent later. Uh, sounds weird to us, but at least that was seen as a form of mercy. All right, so let's dig in here. The Inquisition was a system of tribunals established to combat heresy by prosecuting individuals after holding trial. The Inquisition tribunals existed from 1478 to 1834 but were most active in the 15th and 16th centuries in Spain and all her territories, including the Americas, which is often overlooked. Mm -hmm. The Inquisition existed elsewhere in Europe as part of the broader Roman Inquisition. So it was the ruler of Spain who officially ended the Inquisition in 1834, but it had been about 200 years of the Inquisition just kind of existing in name only and having very little power um, and not really definitely not executing many people in the last 200 years or torturing many people, but it still existed as a way of rooting out and combating heresy, especially the heresy of Protestantism, uh, the heresy of Lutheranism. Um, estimates very wildly, or wildly vary, regarding how many were prosecuted. Uh, some say 100,000 people were were, tried, were prosecuted, that, that would include people tortured, executed, forced to go on some kind of pilgrimage, forced to do penance, or also just released with a slap on the wrist. Uh, and how many were executed, it's very hard to say. Some estimates are as low as 100 people. Uh, other estimates are upwards of one or 2,000. Usually I hear around 2,000 were executed. Um, but it was probably less than that. Numbers were often inflated uh, before the era of modern science. Um, and there are various crimes, including apostasy. To apostatize is to, is to reject the faith, to leave the faith, to be an apostate. Uh, Judaizing, which we've already talked about, that would be to 
Uh, in, in Spain in the Middle Ages, there were many thousands of Jews living there, like a couple hundred thousand Jews. Uh, but there were various times that the, the Spanish monarchs or the king of Aragon or the king of Castile would forcibly baptize Jews or forcibly convert them or go into the Jewish neighborhood and say, y'all are going to build a church and get baptized or you have to go into the Muslim area and then eventually you'll get pushed out of the Muslim area of Spain. Um, so there are a lot of forced conversions that way. Um, but what you also have with the forced conversions, you have Jews who say, yeah, I, I'll, I'll join the church. You know? <laughs> and then he, they just go on doing what they're, what they're going to do anyways. But can you really blame them for that? I mean, how, since when should Christ's love be forced upon people with threats? I mean, never. Um, other, and then other crimes included witchcraft and wizardry. It's cool. I, there are wizards running around in Spain. I guess that's not cool. They, they, I meant to say they, they deserve to get tortured, those wizards. But no, um, wizardry would just be the manipulation of magic, of elements, alchemy, various things, which we I have, guess existed. We have quite a few covenants of witchery here yeah. in the United States today. Covens, yeah. yeah. Yeah, covens of witches. Yeah, there are a lot of witch practicing witches in the cities. There are like hundreds of covens. And a coven can just be like five people, but a coven can also be a couple hundred people. There are hundreds of covens in the cities and many practicing witches. My sister-in-law, who came down this weekend, said that she's involved in, like, foraging groups on the internet, for looking for mushrooms and morals and things in the woods. And she says that the, the farther you go down that road of learning about mushrooms and foraging in, in Minnesota, the, the more you get surrounded by witches. It's like a very popular thing for witches to do and chat about on the internet, finding mushrooms for various spells and things. I don't know. Okay, important people. I got four important people here. First one you've probably heard of, Tomas de Torquemada. I'm not going to do the Mel Brooks thing. Uh, but Torquemada, 1420 to 1498. He was, he's kind of the, if you were to put a face on the Inquisition, it would be Torquemada. He was a Dominican monk. So again, the Dominicans and Franciscans were two orders of monks established in the late Middle Ages. The Dominicans were the uh, and they were both, of, um, sorry, the Dominicans were known as the Order of Preachers, and the, uh, the uh, Franciscans were known as the Mendicants, the Beggars. Um, and these are basically like mobile, mobile groups of monks compared to Benedictines, Cistercians, Augustinians that would have a house, have a monastery that they would live in with surrounding farms, and they would pledge to stay there and remain there except for short trips. What was Luther a member of? The Augustinian order. Augustinian. Yeah. Augustinians in Erfurt, <clears throat> I think. Uh, but yeah, so the Augustinian monk would follow the rule of St. Augustine. Each, each group of monks kind of had it, each order had its own style, or the Catholics would say its own charism, from, which is like our word charismatic, but it's from Greek word charis which means gift, spiritual gift. So each order of monks has its own spiritual gift. The Augustinians were excellent scholars and preachers, just like St. Augustine himself, um, and they were kind of a, an academic order. Uh, and also they were a little bit, I think they were kind of known for being a little bit loose with some of the rules, uh, not as strict and, and serious about things, but a little bit more loose. Augustine, you know, famously uh, wrote so many books on the grace and sermons on the grace of God, on the love of Jesus. And so the Augustinians were sort of a, a, a looser group of monks. And then you have the Benedictines who follow the rule of St. Benedict. Um, the Cistercians, which was a kind of an intensification of the rule of Benedict, an intensification of the Benedictine order. And then, and then later in the Middle Ages, you have the Dominicans and Franciscans. Thomas Aquinas was a Dominican. They were mobile preachers uh, and so a lot of the church hierarchy distrusted them because they weren't settled they didn't have their own area their own monastic house their own lands their own mountain that they lived on but a, 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 a fancy smart alec dominican could travel from rome and wander anywhere and, and teach anything and they were useful though at the same token because there are a lot of poorly trained priests throughout 
you know, Italy, Spain, the Holy Roman Empire, and the Dominicans were these monks that could go over, and these, yeah, these men, these friars that could go, that's what a friar is, is one of these mobile monks um, could go around and preach. And then the Franciscans, like St. Francis, primarily were, were by design supposed to work with the poor and work with the lepers and work with prostitutes, kind of work in the inner city, if you will, um, and beg. They, they didn't have, Francis was disgusted with the ridiculous wealth of the monastic houses throughout Europe. So the Franciscans famously wore a brown robe. Like St. Francis, you see him always in a brown robe with a hood if you have a statue or see him in a painting or something. And the brown robe was just the robe of the poorest person in European society in the late Middle Ages. So it'd be like, I don't know what the equivalent would be today, just wearing jeans and, and a shirt with a lot of holes in them. I don't know. <laughs> That's kind of the same thing. That's kind of what they were going for. But Torquemada was a Dominican monk. He was the first Grand Inquisitor of Spain, a chief supporter of the Alhambra Decree, which expelled the Jews from Spain in 1492. I want to say it expelled like 40,000 Jews from Spain, forced them to vacate Spain, which is, think about how difficult that would be. I mean, if you were living in Spain as a Jew for a couple, you know, your family had been there for hundreds of years, and your land and your houses and possessions, and then you're just forced to leave. Yeah, well, when Columbus was sailing. <laughs> Columbus is like, we got to find a place for these guys. Yeah. Uh, well, um, and then about something like 20,000 Jews converted. So the choice was either to convert or to leave Spain. So a lot of the Jews left Spain in 1492. Torquemada sought, sought to root out heresy and convert Jews and Muslims. A contemporary churchman described the Inquisitor as, quote, the hammer of heretics, the light of Spain, the savior of his country, the honor of his order. So, very different accolade than he's given today. Torquemada, the Grand Inquisitor with his sumptuous robes, sitting on a high throne in a dark chamber of a basilica with, you know, hopeless people in front of them about to be executed. Right? It's not kind of, that's not the contemporary picture of him. He was seen as the honor of the Dominican order because he was so passionate about establishing true doctrine throughout the land. So this must be after the time when the, the Muslims or those guys down there were literally trying to conquer the whole world. So some of them settled here and there and all yeah. the fighting was done. So from about, it's like from the 8th century all the way until the late 15th century, there were Muslims living in Spain, living in the Iberian Peninsula. So for 700 years, for over 700 years, Spain, there were crusades called against the Muslims or the Moors in Spain. There were attempts at reconquest, at pushing them out. There was a huge victory here in like, is it 781? Charles Martel, who is the, who is the, uh, fa the grandfather of Charlemagne, right? He, he, f he won a huge battle uh, against the Muslims and prevented them from entering France. Uh, and then here we have all that's left is a Muslim stronghold in Grenada. Grenada Huntley East Chain. You know, <laughs> where, you know, uh, in Grenada. And then uh, um, it was actually Isabella and Ferdinand who won that final victory against the Muslims in Grenada and pushed them out. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that next. Uh, Isabella I of Castile, 1451 mm -hmm. to 1504, born the same year as Christopher Columbus, Queen of Castile and Aragon. <laughs> is considered the first queen of Spain for her role in unifying the two kingdoms. So there, Spain was made up of two or more kingdoms, but the two biggest ones were Castile and Aragon. And then what happened was the <coughs> queen of Castile married the king of Aragon. So now you have the queen of Castile and Aragon and the king of Castile and Aragon. Basically, they're both just the king and queen of all of Spain. Um, along with her husband, Fernand II of Aragon, the two are called the Catholic Monarchs. That's what they're called for their role in strengthening the Catholic Church in Spain. Specifically, they are known for the Reconquista, the struggle to defeat and force out the Muslims in Spain. So the Reconquista is this, the 700-year Reconquista. The 700-year 700 700-year 700 struggle for the Spanish monarchs to push out the Muslims from Spain. 
Uh, and then Isabella and uh, Ferdinand are also famous for funding the voyage of Christopher Columbus and their aggressive conversion, their aggressive uh, um, project of conversion, converting the Muslims, Jews, and heretics of Spain. That's why they're called the Catholic Monarchs, because they were really serious about the Catholic faith. Now, did they really love Jesus, or did they want a homogenous religious culture because it's easier to rule over? That's for historians to decide, right? But probably a bit of both. They probably were actually pious, although I think that Ferdinand had like five or six illegitimate children. Um, but they were probably both truly pious, and they also wanted uh, a unified religion in their, in their kingdom so that there would be no you know, elements that were not loyal to them and to the Catholic crown. Fernand II lived 1452 to 1516, king of Aragon and then of Castile after marriage to Isabella, considered the first king of Spain. And for, after Isabella died, Fernand was involved in all sorts of confusing wars in France and, Spain, uh, France and, and Italy, the Italian wars of the early 16th century. It's very complicated. If my oldest brother Ben were here, he could tell you all about them, but I can't really make sense of all those wars and all the different houses and, and, and lines of kings and, and queens. But anyways, um, Ferdinand is known as a very, very, very holy and pious and also strong and uh, cunning king. And Isabella, they're called the Catholic monarchs for a reason. And then finally, we have Pope Sixtus IV, 1414 to 1484. Reigned as Pope from 1471 until his death, so he was Pope for a pretty good long time, 13 years. He's famous for building the Sistine Chapel, maybe you've heard of that, uh, and the Vatican Archives, the Vatican Library. And then he also invited uh, scholars, researchers, artists, and sculptors into the Vatican, and he's kind of one of the major patrons of the, um, of the 15th century Renaissance in, in Italy, in, in Rome particularly. He had connections to Florence. He was famous for nepotism. He would, he, all of his cousins and brothers and, and rel relatives, he'd make cardinals and make, you know, chancellors and other things, and, and then they would scratch his back, you know, with money and with titles and everything else. Uh, and then he was also famous for uh, his homosexuality, um, and famous finally for establishing the Spanish Inquisition by a papal bull, papal letter. Um, I was reading about Sixtus IV. There are all sorts of really gross accusations against him, but they're mainly made by his enemies, so you don't know how trustworthy they are. But if he, it's undeniable that he was guilty of nepotism. He would always give lands, titles, and and you know, relics to people he knew and to his relatives, and then he got stuff in return. So usually that shows you're a pretty crooked individual if you're doing that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> and then let's talk about his papal bull. Exigit, uh, exigit sin carea devotiones affectus, which is the first line of the papal bull. That, every papal bull is titled after its first line. That's where it gets its title. So that, that means in Latin, sincere devotion is required. And the monarchs of Spain, the Catholic monarchs, Isabella and Ferdinand, had written to the Pope saying, hey, we want to establish a, tri a system of tribunals here uh, uh, led by, grand, by a grand inquisitor and by, by the Suprema, or the Supreme Inquisitorial Council, made up of cardinals and experts in canon law and church lawyers and, and people. And we want to, uh, we're having a problem with, with the reconversion of Muslims and, and Jews. It seems that a lot of people are crypto Jews these days. They're Judaizing. They're secretly Jews, but pretending to be Christians. And we want your official blessing to establish this. And the Pope was like, yeah, sure. Want to give me a little something in return? <laughs> Probably. Uh, and in that, uh, in that letter, this is, kinda, this is from the first paragraph of that letter, that papal bull. From your letter recently shown us, we learn that in various cities, sections, and regions of the Spanish kingdoms, many of those who are of their own accord were born anew in Christ in the sacred waters of baptism, while continuing to comport themselves externally as Christians, yet have secretly adopted or returned to the religious observances and customs of the Jews, and are living according to the principles and ordinances of Judaical superstition and falsehood, thus falling away from the true Orthodox faith, its worship, 
and belief in its doctrines. And then the papal bull continues to just give to give the papal blessing uh, to the church ruler, church leaders rather in Spain, uh, to serve as lawyers and prosecutors and, attorney, and defense attorneys, and then to hand over uh, those who are deemed guilty to the secular arm, to the state. So the church, it was never the, a bunch of cardinals, you know, whipping people, or the pope himself who would slap and then, you know, hang someone up by a noose. They, they would, the, the church authorities were the court of law, and then they would hand over the people to the secular arm, to the so it'd be like I said before, it'd be like if we tried someone and then we handed them over to the Fairmont police for, for punishment. It was never the church that punished. It was the church that, you know, deemed someone guilty or not guilty. Then I thought, I got this handy book, The Spanish Inquisition, an Anthology of Sources. This belongs on every Christian shelf. <laughs> um, 1478, you see that's when the papal bull was established. And this ends in 1614. That's really when the last big trials happened, the early 17th century. Then the next hundred years of the Inquisition, it kind of just existed on paper. Um, but there's a really interesting trial uh, of Pedro de Viegas. And this is on page 17 of this book. And it's interesting because the Inquisitors would, take, would, would record notes and, and all of these notes and things from the trials we have access to and scholars have access to and they've put together into handy dandy books to uh, read but this will just give you a taste of what the big deal was with Judaizing and sort of what the process was during the Spanish Inquisition so this is the Inquisition trial of Pedro de Viegas 1483 to 1484 nine o'clock in the morning on December 19th 1483 in the houses where the reverend lord inquisitors reside and hold their court. The reverend lords were seated, and in our presence, we being the secretaries and witnesses written below, the honorable Fernando Rodriguez de Barco, who was a cleric, a chaplain of the king, and a chief prosecutor of the Holy Inquisition, appeared. He said that he intended to accuse Pedro de Viegas, a resident of the city, who was being held in the Holy Inquisition's prison, and he asked the inquisitors to order Viegas taken out and brought before them. Seeing his petition, the inquisitors ordered the constable, who was present, to remove Viegas and bring him to the court. With Viegas present, the chief prosecutor then submitted a writ of accusation against him, the content of which follows. Reverend and virtuous Lord Judges, inquisitors of heretical iniquity, I, Fernando Rodriguez de Barco, chaplain of the king, chief prosecutor of the Holy Inquisition, appear before your lordships and accuse Pedro de Viegas, resident of this city. I say that Pedro de Viegas lives with the reputation of a Christian, is called a Christian, and exercises and enjoys the privileges of a Christian. Yet with calumny against our Lord and his holy Catholic faith, and in violation of the censures and penalties for heresy and Judaizing, Pedro de Viegas has observed the law of Moses and its ceremonies and rituals, and apostatized apostatized in this way. First, Pedro de Viegas ate meat during Lent without a need or a reason for it. If, if you were sick or ill, you were allowed to eat meat during Lent, or you were allowed to break any fast if you were sick or ill, on account of Jewish ceremony and in contempt of our holy Catholic faith. Next, he ate unleavened bread on the Jewish Passover. Next, he willingly observed the Sabbath on Saturdays in his house, on account of reverence for Jewish ceremony, he ordered his household adorned as if it were a feast day. It's funny, so far it's like, check, 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 we eat meat during Lent. We, we've, haven't you celebrated the Passover <coughs> cedar here before? Or eaten, or eaten matzo bread? I mean, who of us hasn't? Uh, and then observe the Sabbath. I mean, have you ever gone to Saturday night church? Right? <laughs> okay, so you all owe... A great deal of penance for your, for your apostasy. Next, Pedro de Viegas is a Judaizer and a heretic and observed Mosaic law in other matters and instances that I will make known in this brief trial as they come to my attention, etc., etc. And then uh, he presents the rest of the evidence against him. There is then an interrogation of him, a questioning of him, and then there are statements of people he knows. Diego Philippe, a witness that Pedro himself 
brought to the stand. A statement of Antonio, a cloth maker who lived in the town. A statement of a local friar who basically said that he did not, he does not know, he's never seen Pedro de Villegas break any Christian laws, break any laws of the fa uh, fasting laws or anything. A uh, statement of Fernando de Jose's alderman of the city. Um, he also, he, he just said that he's seen Pedro working on Saturdays. Doesn't seem like a very Jewish thing to do to work on the Sabbath day. And then a statement of Juan Bastante Dyer, a uh, cloth dyer that is. And then they brought in witnesses for the prosecution. And then they delivered the sentence. We, Pedro Diaz de la Costaña, licentiate in holy theology, and Francisco Sanchez de la Fuente, doctor in canon law, acting as inquisitorial judges of heretical iniquity by apostolic authority. And I, Pedro Diaz, licentiate officer and general vicar for the most reverend Lord Pedro Gonzalez, de Mendoza, Cardinal of Spain, Archbishop of Toledo, have witnessed a trial now pending before us between two parties. On the one hand, the Honorable Fernando Rodriguez del Barco, cleric, chaplain of the king, our chief prosecutor. On the other hand, Pedro de Villegas, a resident of Ciudad Real, concerning an accusation that the prosecutor presented against him. In this accusation, the prosecutor said that though Villegas has the reputation and name of a Christian, he is in fact a heretic and apostate, for he follows Mosaic law and performs his ceremonies. Specifically, that Villegas ate unleavened bread in the Passover, Passover of the Jews and agreed to clean and decorate his house in honor of Saturday and to observe Saturday as the Sabbath. He ate meat during Lent without a need to do so, in contempt of our holy faith, and in order to honor and follow Mosaic law. The prosecutor says Villegas performed other ceremonies and Jewish rituals to honor and follow that Mosaic law, and accordingly asked that Villegas be declared a heretic and they incur the legal punishments against heretics, and that justice be served. And seeing how Villegas denied the accusation, saying he had been good, at, he had been a good and faithful Christian, and had never done the things of which he was accused, Pedro de Villegas and the chief prosecutor were together received for proof. Each party presented the witnesses that he wanted, and their statements and depositions were written down, and each party was provided with a copy of that material. And each party was given a time limit to allege whatever they wished in the defense and prosecution of their rights. Once this was done, we decided this trial was concluded. Having shared our opinion and counsel with learned men and religious people of good and sound conscience, and having imparted to them this entire trial, following their advice, common opinion, and deliberation, we find the chief prosecutor did not prove the accusation against Pedro de Villegas according to what he had to prove by law. And conversely, Pedro de Villegas proved himself to have lived as a good and faithful Christian. Interesting. So he was acquitted. And then the three days or four days that he spent rotting in prison were taken out of his purgatory time. Which is pretty sweet. Pretty good for him. So Alan? when did the Catholics decide you couldn't eat meat during Lent? Oh, that, that's a very ancient, uh, very, very ancient tradition. Um, I mean, going back maybe even to the first century, second century. Um, so uh, it, was that all during Lent or just on Fridays? Uh, I believe probably all during Lent, because yeah. usually the rules are lessened as time goes on. You know, <clears throat> at first you weren't allowed to be a certain type of person to be an altar boy. Then, okay, any boy can be an altar boy. Okay, now girls can be altar boys too, and they're called altar girls, right? The rules are always kind of decreasing. You can't commune if you're divorced. Oh, okay, you can commune if you're divorced and you're repentant. Oh, okay, you can commune if you're divorced. Right? So with the fasting rules for Lent, yeah, I'd say they were very strict. I think, I mean, the rules vary wi widely according to region, but at one time I think Wednesdays and Fridays were the preferred days of fasting yeah. for Lent. That's Sunday was kind of seen as the feast day, as the time to kind of celebrate the resurrection beforehand, because Christ already has resurrected. Um, <laughs> But then various people, and especially monastic groups, would have different fasting traditions. But, I mean, very, very ancient, though, to answer your question. Very ancient. Um, so isn't that interesting that Pedro de Villegas, you kind of have a taste of how things worked during the Inquisition. Um, now I want to read a little bit about the account of the Lutherans from the Suprema. The Suprema would be the Supreme Inquisitorial Council to Pope Paul IV in 1558. 
So there are Lutherans running around in Spain during this time, and uh, the Inquisition did not trust them, and so they wrote a letter to the popes basically saying, this is what we've witnessed, this is what's going on, what do you think we should do? This is account of the Lutherans from the Suprema to Pope Paul IV, September 9th, 1558. Um, uh, marginal note, this account was sent with the Suprema's letter. Okay, so this was sent with another letter to the Pope. <clears throat> After the heresies and errors of Luther and his followers had come to light, they extended through much of Christendom. In comparison, by the grace of God, the heart of Spain remained untouched by this stain because of the great care and vigilance of the ministers of the Holy Office of the Inquisition. It is true that some individuals who are barely natives and others who are outright foreigners have been convicted and condemned for these Lutheran heresies in Spain when they could be found. The penalties they merited were carried out on their bodies. When they fled, they were tried as rebels and condemned in their absence and contumacy. A year ago, more or less, because of certain warnings and signs, inquisitors in Seville began to inquire diligent, diligently about certain people in that city. The inquisitors' efforts came to the attention of some monks of the monastery of St. Isidro, which was outside the city walls. These monks are members of the Order of Hermits of St. Jerome, some understanding themselves to be guilty immediately fled the monastery. So some of those monks in this monastery were supposedly Lutherans at this time. Uh, fled the monastery, archbishopric, and kingdom. It is understood that they are now in Germany, and their names follow in a memorandum. Out of the monks who remained, eight are imprisoned in the Inquisition in Seville, along with their accomplices. Not interesting. So there's a monastery harboring Lutheran, uh, Lutheran, what's the word I'm looking for? Lutheran tendencies, Lutheran... Sympathizers? Sympathies, that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, harboring Lutheran sympathies. It was also known at this time that a Spanish man named Julian Hernandez had arrived in Seville from Germany. He carried letters from a heretic named Juan Perez de Pineda, who was Spanish but was now living in Germany. These letters were for certain high-ranking people of Seville. The man named... The man named Julian also brought with him many heretical books in Latin as well as in Spanish. These are probably Martin Luther's Latin works. Um, uh, and he divided them among certain people who paid him well. This man was alerted, hidden, and persuaded to flee immediately because the inquisitors would know who he was and would burn him. Because of the diligence of the inquisitors, he was seized in the Sierra Morena, 30 leagues from Seville. He was then brought to Seville and is now imprisoned there. He initially was very obstinate in his heresies and spoke about many other people. He now seems to show repentance and, is, and a desire to be under the Catholic faith. From his imprisonment and the monks, many more arrests have resulted, and they are all prisoners. It is hoped that other imprisonments will occur in Seville and its territory. Isn't that interesting? And then he talks about all these other Lutheran seeds throughout other areas in Spain. And he talks about the Lutheran errors needing appropriate measures and appropriate punishment, etc., etc. So, there you go. So even Lutherans were tried by the Spanish Inquisitors, which I had never known until I checked out this book. <laughs> uh, but it makes sense. You know, the Inqui Inquisition was around for several hundred years. Okay, uh, let's kind of form some conclusions now. I, I at least have five. You could probably come up with more conclusions about the Spanish Inquisition. But the first one is that Spain and, and the Inquisition are far more complicated than broad, inexact generalizations will allow. There were many different political and religious forces behind the Inquisition. We talked about some of that political hegemony, forcing the Muslims out as part of their re, recon, reconquista, uh, and, and many other factors. At the bottom was a religious desire for true faith and a political desire for hegemony and stability. So, I mean, it, you've all heard this before, but people will say, well, Christians are bad too. You guys have the Inquisition. And, you know, it's just like someone will just shoot that off there. And usually Christians will be like, yeah, I don't know anything about that really beyond what you know, so I'm also ashamed of it. But now you, you, after this Bible study, hopefully you can say, well, do you even know anything about the Inquisition? Do you know how broad, complicated it is, how... There are probably only about a thousand executions, and and 
you know, you can you can go on. And I mean, a thousand executions. Obviously, we don't execute someone for being a Jew, uh, for being Muslim. Um, but in many ways, the church leaders were carrying out what had been established as law in the land. So it was the church leaders following the king and the queen of Spain. So it was, in other words, it was the king and queen of Spain establishing the Inquisition, not the other way around, right? Um, so the Inquisitors, it, we see, were some of them were just trying to do their jobs. Others of them probably relished the fact that they could torture Jews and sentence them. Alan? It almost sounds like Hitler got his idea from this kind of stuff. Yeah, he just dispensed with the trial and yeah. wasn't after. Yeah, was wasn't after religious truth, but after uncontaminated Aryan blood or something. Um, but Spain and the Inquisition are way more complicated. Sort of like when we talk about the Crusades, so many factors go into the Crusades. It's not just a bunch of crazy Christians wanting to go over somewhere and kill Muslims and pillage cities. The Inquisition wasn't that just a bunch of scary men in robes wanted to. You know, execute Jews or something. Uh, discussions of the Inquisitions are skewed by gross exaggerations. So there are all, often a lot of exaggerations. Punishment, torture, humiliation, and, and imprisonment were actually rare. The vast number of punishments were minor. I'd say over 90% of the punishments were involved good works, participation in a crusade, pilgrimages, offerings, fasting, and fines. So most people were not killed or even tortured or imprisoned. They were given penance, works, acts, works of penance that they were supposed to do. Like if there would have been a Judaizing Christian who got caught one time celebrating the Sabbath, he gets slapped on the wrist, forced to go through to 12 confessions or something to say this many prayers, and then he had to go on a pilgrimage to this city 50 miles away with a shrine to Mary. Something like that would be a kind of a typical punishment. Um, which, obviously, even that, I mean, to force someone to do that you, is arguably a, a bad thing to do, too, right? Um, but you see that it was not as barbaric as, as people popularly think today. The Inquisition was not directed against other religions. The Inquisition only had jurisdiction against professed Catholics. So that's another key point that people often forget. They think that the Inquisition would just bring in a group of Jews from their synagogue and burn their books and... That happened in the Middle Ages, but not through the Inquisition. The Inquisition was only uh, only allowed to try in the court uh, professed Catholics. Now, those could be professed Catholics that were that were Jews that were just you know kidding or lying, and because they were forcibly <laughs> baptized, but they belonged to the Catholic Church nevertheless. Um, the Inquisition. This is kind of shocking. The Inquisition for the time was surprisingly fair and just. False accusations were severely punished. So anytime if there was, you know, I saw my neighbor uh, uh, and he, he's, uh, he's circumcised and he uh, it never eats pork. Okay, well, examine the man. You're lying. You know, you, you're, you have to go to prison now and do this penance for, for perjury and, and a false accusation against your neighbor. Um, two witnesses per accusation were needed. So you always need at least two witnesses. The accused was given a lawyer as well. The ecclesial courts were more fair than the civil courts. Isn't that, isn't that strange? You don't think about that, but it's, it's true. I mean, just based on that little thing we read, you can see that actually you had all these lawyers and experts as part of the Inquisition. They really did want to root out heresy, but they also really did want to be fair in most cases. Um, there are cases of criminals intentionally blaspheming so that their cases would be transferred to the far more balanced ecclesial courts. So that's interesting, isn't it? That's kind of proof that those ecclesial courts, those church courts, were fair if criminals are intentionally pretending to be Jews so that they get to go to the... I get to go to the Inquisition. You know? <laughs> I don't have to go to the dungeon keeper in the, in the, below this castle where I'm probably going to die, but I can go to this nice church and I'm going to be held in prison for a couple weeks and then and given food and then I'll be released because my witnesses will say yeah he's just he's he's messing around or he's not actually a Judaizer and finally generally speaking the inquisition was carried out humanely though there were still abuses and scandals and those abuses and scandals are terrible I mean there were people who were innocent who were executed you know and people who were innocent who were but innocent of what? I, I mean, that's the thing, too. If, it, is it, if you're a Jew and you're forced to become a Christian, but you stay faithful to your Judaism, 
What are you guilty of? The, the, you know, the Christians are guilty of forcing you to accept Christ when you don't, or forcing you to be baptized, spraying you with a hose to baptize you, or whatever it is that they did. You know, that's, that's, that's obviously wrong. Um, but you see there's a lot more nuance with the Inquisition than people popularly think, especially the part about the courts being, the, the process was carried out in a very specific manner, a uh, very fair manner, with a certain amount of witnesses and lawyers and defense attorneys, uh, and they always sought after the truth. But when they did find you guilty, they, they would deal with your guilt, and so that's obviously still... Do you think Luther was pretty fortunate he was in Germany and not Spain? Oh, man. I think he would have been. Yeah. Compared to, yeah, compared to Spain, which was united, you know, uh, six, or united some 50 years before the Reformation, Germany was disunited until the mid-19th century, right? There were different <clears throat> kingdoms and, and principalities, kind of independent free cities. And so Luther found his electors who were, who were loyal to the Reformation and the cause, and they harbored him and kept him safe. But yeah, if he would have been in a unified Spain or a unified Catholic France, yeah, it would have just fizzled out for sure. Yeah, he owes a lot to Duke Frederick the Wise, who protected yeah. him so. And this guy, even though he was a, not really dedicated to a whole lot, but he saw Luther and he really liked his teachings and stuff, and I'm gonna protect him. Right, right. Yeah, that's what, I mean, if it weren't for the princes, for the dukes, the electors of Germany, the Reformation would not have been able to take place at all. There's no way. And there was a lot of anti-papalism in Germany in the 16th century. Germany's always kind of struggled against Rome. Rome has always tried to extend itself into Germany, and the Germans have always wanted to do their own thing. They've always wanted to be more independent. Even to this day, the German bishops are always the kind of crazy outlier bishops. And it's, the, and it's the archbishops and cardinals and from Italy and from Spain who are more loyal to the papacy. Well, during those times, Germany was really a, more of an industrial country and had lots of value and money. And mm. I think a lot of these people wanted that to become a part yeah. of their domain and stuff. Yeah, Italy has no forests. Germany has trackless forests, right? Um, Italy Wind and coal and all those things yeah. began to become important. Right, and other, other resources, definitely. Okay, uh, what's the significance today of the Spanish Inquisition? Well, today the Spanish Inquisition has become something of a catch-all to describe the darker moments of Christian history. So we've all probably heard that or thought of that or um, seen that accusation before on the History Channel or YouTube or somewhere or in a personal conversation that, well, you Christians, you, you are the guys of the Spanish Inquisition. You know, you guys are, Christianity is dark and terrible. Well, it was actually more like medieval Spain and, or go anywhere in the world. Was China, were, were the Native Americans kind to everybody and living in harmony? Or did they have slaves and did they rape and decapitate people? They, they did. You know, the Native Americans did that. Go to China, go to India, go to Europe. It's, it's everywhere. Everywhere where the gospel is covered up or where people aren't living out the law of love of our Lord, there's going to be barbarism. And then the expulsion and forced conversion of the Jews of Spain are far more problematic than the Inquisition. That's my personal opinion, but by the, the Alhambra decree, which expelled the Jews from Spain and then forced many thousands to convert, basically at the point of, you know, uh, point of a sword, uh, that's, to me, that's far more problematic than a tribunal set up by the secular powers because um, the forced conversion and expulsion of the Jews of Spain you know, affected tens and tens and tens of thousands of people and probably hardened them. And maybe there are Jews who are thinking, we're, th we're a Jewish family, we're thinking about converting. And then they're told, give up all your possessions and get out of here. Well, nuts to that, I'm gonna be a Jew the rest of my days. You know, That probably did so much harm, more harm than we'll ever know. Where is the Inquisition? Apparently, it's done harm in our modern world, but at the time, uh, it's, it's difficult to say at, at the time. At the time, you see, the other accounts of the Inquisition were that these Inquisitors are heroes, preserving the faith, saving Spain from our enemies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sonia? Well, some of that, the attitudes kept going on then, so when um, Columbus 
or no, I should, when Columbus was going to the New World, Isabella and Ferdinand wanted to send priests so that the Indians could be converted. And wow. some of those priests were great. They, they wanted to teach these people about God's word. Mm -hmm. Some were more interested in the gold or whatever yeah. else they thought was there. And some really weren't interested in showing them God's love. Right. It, you know, and you still see that the, you know, some people weren't taught right because now you've got the um, mixture of their religion and Roman Catholicism, so they still, supposedly they're Christians, but they don't understand. Right. And, and so over 500 years later, it is, still hasn't been done right. Right. That's, that's very true, yeah. Well, we're going to actually talk about that, I think, next week. Mm -hmm. We talk about the age of discovery. Is empire beneficial for the kingdom of God? Spreading missionaries, Columbus, mm -hmm. Amerigo Vespucci, all those guys we're going to talk about next time. So that should be interesting. Mm -hmm. So thank you all. That concludes our session today on the Spanish Inquisition.